Welcome back. Today in this lecture, we're going to look at another approach to valuation. This time, we're going to use earnings. So why are earnings a good variable as a base for valuation? One is that earnings is um, a common measure that is available, uh, so it's easily available. Um, also, it is a, is a financial variable that analysts and shareholders and management all look at, and it has an impact on um, stock prices. So obviously, um, the market, uh, market participants um, believe that there is a strong relationship between earnings and value. And it is also important because, again, uh, earnings is something that is a is an important performance index for management. So management use um, earnings to, as a index for allocating resources as well as um, providing incentive and um, compensation to managers. So and uh, for earnings forecast um, is an entire industry by itself. Um, so a lot of attention is given to earnings. So there's a lot of information available. So those are all good reasons for uh, using an earnings-based model. But earnings also have some drawbacks. First and foremost is that earnings are not cash flows. So, so they are uh, because the fundamental principle of valuation is that the value of an investment is the present value of future cash flows. Uh, earnings may not be the best proxy for the actual cash flows for an investment. Another major reason that earnings may be problematic is because management can manage earnings. Uh, some of these manipulations are illegal and management can go to jail for it. Uh, some manipulations are, are not illegal, but they violate U.S. GAAP. So it's, um, uh, that may eventually land a company into trouble. Uh, the majority of earnings management that is uh, done by companies are both legal and consistent with GAAP, but they reflect they re they are reflected in low quality. So we talk about earnings quality. So it is important. Uh, so what that means is if you analyze a company and you believe that the earnings for this company is of poor quality, then obviously the earnings based valuation model will not be a good fit for this particular firm. Final, uh, finally, the last, the last uh, reason why uh, some analysts object to using earnings as a valuation base is because management is not required to distribute earnings to shareholders. So the, co the company can retain the earnings forever. This is highly unlikely if the market is sufficient and there is sufficient competition. So uh, what we want to do is pay attention to individual firms to make sure that they are not um, earnings are not being manipulated and that management is actively returning, uh, distributing um, cash back to stockholders, either in the form of dividend or stock repurchase. So as long as the company uh, does do those things, then an earnings-based valuation model is appropriate. So how do we apply this? Um, first of all, we need to define a measure of earning because there are many definitions. You can have EBITDA, you can have operating income, you can have taxable income or earnings before tax, you can also have net income, uh, you can have comprehensive income. So what do, how do we define this? Um, what, we, what we do is we define something called a residual income. So let's take a look at what that is. Residual income is defined as comprehensive income minus the co cost of equity times the book value. Remember that cost of equity is the required return demanded by shareholders based on the risk of the firm. So this is the required return. This is what the 
uh, investor has invested in the firm at the beginning of the period, so T minus one. So this is the required return expressed in dollar in dollars. Comprehensive income is what the firm generated. So the residual income is what the firm generated minus what investor demanded. So you, so let's take a look at the intuition behind this formulation. Let's define ROE for comprehensive income. So we define return on equity using comprehensive income as the numerator. So this is uh, if you take the comprehensive income divided by the beginning book value, that is your ROE. So this is what the firm is generating in return. So if the firm's if the return that is generated by management is greater by the required return by shareholders, residual income will be positive. If it's less than the required return, meaning management is not meeting shareholders' expectation, then residual income will be negative. If they're exactly the same, residual income will be zero. So let's take a look at what are some circumstances we may expect to see that. So what we, are, what we are suggesting here is that if management can generate return on equity that's greater than the required return, residual income is positive and additional value is created. This type of wealth, crea wealth creation is often, often happens during the growth stage of a firm. Remember the different life stage of a firm? So at the initial growth stage, um, we would expect to see this. Um, however, during the decline stage, it may happen that management cannot generate sufficient return. Now, in a, in a competitive marketplace, if management is destroying wealth, uh, they will not be able to survive for long. So therefore, in the long term, long run equilibrium, we will expect that firms that are not able to generate sufficient return to meet the requirement, uh, they will go out of business. Um, and for industry or companies that are generating very high return, much greater than the required return, will attract competitors to enter the market space. So in the long run, uh, we expect that in the equilibrium, return on equity will likely be the same as the required return and the residual income will be zero. So these are the rationale behind residual income. Next, let's take a look at how do we do valuation based on residual income. The model is uh, slightly different than what we've seen before. The residual income valuation model start with the current book value of common equity. So you start with today's book value. So the value today is equal to book value plus the present value. This is a present value formula. We, we are quite familiar with that of the residual income. So remember, this is our definition of residual income. We take comprehensive income minus cost of equity times the beginning book value. So similar to what we have just seen, if the, uh, if the ROE, if the return generated by the firm is greater than the cost of equity, residual income will be positive and the value will be greater than the initial book value. So if you think of uh, in the extreme case uh, where a company starts with cash, so investor just put cash into the business. Then of course the book value is equal to exactly the value of the firm because cash is cash is cash. But once the investor, once the once management or the entrepreneur put the cash into use, and if the way that they invested the cash, purchase equipment, produce product, produce uh, provide services, generates po um, positive residual income then the value of the firm will be greater than the book value. Vice versa, if the required return is greater than what the firm can generate, residual income will be negative and the value of the firm will be less than the book value. So if this is sufficiently true, 
then you you will expect to see a uh, a a merger happening or an acquisition happening. So it's a firm that is selling at way below its book value. Um, it will it will uh, it will probably attract corporate um, takeovers. And then finally, if they are the same, then residual income will be zero, and the value will exactly be equal to the book value today. And the difference between the value and book value is the present value of all future residual income. We're going to go through a, a few examples to illustrate this. Our first example will have zero residual income. In other words, the ROE is the same as the required return. And the company is going to pay out 100% in dividend. So the assumption is that investor invested $10,000 in common equity. So at time zero, the, the firm's book value is also $10,000. So think of this as putting $10,000 cash into the company. Of course, the company is worth $10,000, or the book value is $10,000. Um, you, you can use the $10,000 to acquire asset, um, and the book value will still remain $10,000. Investors, the, our, the required return is 10%. Assumption is that the ROE is also 10%, and that's why we have zero residual income. Investors expect the company to pay out all its dividend. So the expected income in year one is $10,000 because we expect to earn 10% on $10,000, so the income will be $1,000. Residual income is defined as comprehensive income, so $1,000 minus ROE, uh, cost of equity, which is 10% times $10,000, which is also $1,000. So residual income is zero, which is our, uh, this is how we designed this example. So book value in all future years will remain unchanged because all earnings are paid out as dividend. And there's no, we, we are simplifying this example. There's no repurchase and no new stock issuance. And all future residual income will also be zero because the book value doesn't change. So every year you will generate 10% on $10,000. You'll generate $1,000. You'll, you'll pay out. $10,000, so everything remains the same. And zero divided by anything is zero. So when you add up all the zeros, you still have zero. So the value of the firm is the same as the initial book value of $10,000. So this is the zero residual income with no dividend payout case. And so this establish that this is so this is a simple example is to establish the concept of uh, why an earnings based valuation approach can make sense. In our second example, we'll still work with zero residual income, but in this case, the firm will not pay out any dividend. Remember, that's one of the concerns. So let's take a look at what may happen. We have the same assumption. So book value, initial book value is $10,000. Investors require a return of 10%, and the ROE is also 10%. Investors expect the company to not pay out any dividend. Now, obviously, if this is true forever, um, that will be a, um, a concern. But let's assume that investors are OK with that. So in the first year, expected co comprehensive income is 10% on $10,000, so that's $1,000, the same as our last case. The residual income in year one is also zero because it's 10% times $10,000. But because the company does not pay out its income at all, retained earning will be $1,000 because Retain, the dividend is zero, so the entire $1,000 goes into retained earnings. And that will increase book value by $1,000. So book value at the end of year one would be $11,000. So in year two, since we expect to earn 10% on our last 
book last year's book value. So we are going to earn 10% on $11,000 and our comprehensive income is $1,100. Our residual income will still be zero because investors now has $11,000 invested in the firm because you didn't pay anything back out to investor. So now the investor is going to demand that 10% required return on $11,000. So your residual income is still zero. Uh, you will see that retained earnings will go up again and book value will go up again. So all future residual income will also be zero. So again, zero divided by anything is zero. Adding all the zeros up will still be zero. So the value of um, the firm will be the same as the book value. As you can see, dividend does uh, dividend policy does not affect the value in this case. As long as the residual income is zero, then um, the book value will be the same as the um, the value of the firm. In the third example, we're going to take a look at a scenario where the residual income is negative initially. So our assumptions are very similar. We have $10,000 in equity in the beginning. Given the risk of the company, the required return, the cost of equity is 10%. Comprehensive income is going to be $1,000 for the first three years. And then starting in year four, you will earn a return that is the same as the required return. In other words, residual, residual income will be zero starting from year four on. And investors expect to pay out no dividend. So in year one, the expected income, we say, is going to be $1,000 for three years. So residual income in year one is zero because 10% on $1,000, subtract that from 1,000 is zero. The company does not pay any dividend, so retained earnings is the same as residual income, so book value increased by $1,000. So by year two, remember expect, uh, comprehensive income will be $1,000 for three years. So year two is also $1,000. Residual income in year two, is negative, negative $100, because now the required return of 10% on book value, which is $11,000. Retained earning in year two is also $1,000 because retained earning comes from comprehensive income. So book value at the end of year two would have increased to $12,000. And then in year three, once again, we only earn $1,000 in comprehensive income. And now a book value was $12,000. So 10% on that is $1,200. So our residual income in year three is minus $200. Retained earning in year three will increase once again by $1,000, increase up to $13,000. Remember in starting in year four, will have zero residual income. So expected comprehensive income is 10% on the book value of 13,000. So it will be $1,300. Residual income will, will be zero. That is our assumption. So now we can uh, value the firm. So we have the initial value plus the present value of future residual income. So this is year one. Our residual income year one was zero. So we discounted back one year. Our residual income in year two is negative 100. In year three is negative 200. And then starting in year four, this is all zero. And with the value turns out to be $9,767, which is less than the initial book value of, of $10,000. So when residual income is negative, the value of the firm will be less than the book value. As you probably have guessed, we will take a look at the case where residual income is positive. Assumption is very similar, a $10,000 company, a 10% required return. In this case, comprehensive income is going to be $1,500 for the first three years. And then starting in year four, 
residual income will be zero. So, and the company also won't pay out any dividend. So in year one, we get $1,500. Residual income is $1,500 comprehensive income minus 10% required return times the book value of $10,000. So $1,500 minus $1,000 is $500. Company pays no dividends, so retain earning increases by $1,500 and the book value also increases by $1,500 to $11,500. In year, year two, we also have comprehensive income of $1,500. Residual income is now $350 because the required return of 10% is applied to the new book value of $11,500. And retain earning once again increased by another $1,500. So ending book value by the end of year two is $13,000. Continuing with year three, our expected income continue to be $1,500. Residual income is now only $200 because we need to subtract 10% on the new book value of $13,000. Retain earning again increased by uh, is also $1,500 and book value increase to $14,500. Remember that starting in year four, residual income will be zero because the um, return on the book value is the same as the required return. So residual income starting from year four on will be zero. And the value of the firm is the initial book value plus the residual income in year one, discounted back one year, residual income in year two, discounted back two years, and residual income in year three, discounted back three years. All future residual income is zero, so we don't have to worry about that. So the value of the firm turns out to be $10,894. So when residual income is positive, the value of the firm will be greater than the book value. So the book value is only $10,000. The value of the firm is 10,894. And that is because the firm is able to generate positive residual income for three years. We'll end this video here. We'll continue with applying the residual income valuation model in the next video. See you soon.